<laughs> that was a nice chat. Huh? <laughs> I was like, I can't see the recording counter. Oh. Yeah, but it doesn't. It just, it's not obvious that it's not. Yeah. Doing it. <laughs> uh, it's obvious when it is doing it. Have we got nothing? Do you think? No, do you, we've got nothing. No, or do you get we've got nothing? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I hadn't done it. Good rehearsal. A good rehearsal. This week, we're tackling Jono's very fun sketch, actually, on the law of diminishing returns. Hello, and welcome to Sketchplanations, the podcast. How did you get here? What? How did you get here? What do you mean? Like, what transport did I take? Or what route? How did you get here? Ah, oh, do you mean like, in life? How did I get to this point in life where I'm talking to you here and now? How did you get here? How did you get here? Right, I'm, listen, I'm done with this, mate. I don't know who you are or what you're trying to do, but you're an idiot. No matter how you got here, we're very pleased that you are. Ignore that weirdo at the door. He's always doing strange things like that. I'm Rob Bell. Came on the bus. And joining me on the podcast, energised from their tenacious tandem ride here, uphill and down dale, at the helm and in charge of navigation, it's John O'Hay. And sneakily watching YouTube clips of 1980s movie blunders on his phone at the rear, it's Tom Pellero. Good evening, my friends. How are you both? Very well, thank you. Very Good well. Evening. Yeah. Ah, tandems. Tommy, uh, have you still got your tandem? You, I remember you had one years ago. Absolutely. I mean, you, you got it. Did you buy that for the specific reason I'm thinking of? Uh, so um, Sarah got it, borrowed it from a friend for our first, second mm. ever date. And then later she actually managed to, to buy it from the, from the guy because he was moving away. Uh, and then we did it up uh, and we actually rode away from our wedding on it, on our, on our wedding day. That's from what the I was church. thinking of. Yeah, it was incredible. It was brilliant. It was brilliant. And you, Very you, photos. Yeah, so it didn't have just married on the yeah, back. Yeah, a little a yeah. big sign on the back, and uh, there was a bit of controversy which I didn't really realise until later that the night before Sarah's mum, uh, my, my wife's mum, had said you can't, no, you can't, you definitely can't leave the wedding on that, and Sarah was adamant that we were. Uh, I didn't know about this at all, so they almost had a massive falling out the night before the wedding, uh, and Sarah had to do loads of sort of maintenance on the bike to ensure that no oil went on her on her wedding dress on the day which was obviously what sarah's mum was most concerned about <laughs> have you still got it yeah you still yeah got it, and I, I gotta say it is a really good um new relationship tester when we've got friends coming right. over and they're sort of newly together or they've only been together about a year because it's it's quite difficult to ride it it requires quite a lot of coordination and the brakes are not kind of great so you've got to do it together and you've got to be in time and the, the sort of mini little arguments or sometimes really quite big arguments are are really quite enjoyable to watch <laughs> you should um, market it to uh, dating apps that's like <laughs> yes. the next the next step. the next the next test like the can canoes are similar yeah. right? you're like no <laughs> you want to paddle right paddle right mm. no the other way yeah. I what? am doing it, no, but you're steering. But no, you're going. The I right actually. Way. What would you yeah. rather? Stressful. I, I, fall off, fall off the bike on the road, oh. or uh, fall out of the canoe with uh, somebody in a new relationship. Yeah. The, the, the waters are less violent. That you're not going to hurt yourself, right? Yeah, it depends on the temperature. Yeah, but you're, Johnny, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Because I, I had a relationship where we went out canoeing, and I, I did get out on the sandbank <laughs> in the middle of the estuary. It was just, just, just. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it just it. wasn't going well. <laughs> really? I literally, you le you left I literally, I literally got out and had to have a bit of a moment because, like, this is not. This is. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is excellent. Oh, that is very a good. Long time ago, but you are right. Very good tests. Um, of course, we've we've all experienced a tandem, right? Or six a six man bike yes uh for the charity thing we did a few years ago it, um that was pretty six spectacular bike. it was yeah from london to amsterdam six six saddles all in a line it was about i don't know five six meter long bike it's massive ne thing. nearly impossible to steer <laughs> yeah. regular, bizarrely impossible to steer yeah. I mean, mini roundabouts <laughs> were only a, time an to do nightmare. and especially dangerous <laughs> for the person at the through. back who 
I think a couple of times the person at the back got clipped off by some kind of sign yeah. or post or something like that. Yeah. It's probably why they don't sell them commercially. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that and most people the first time riding it was out on uh, the busy roads of London at rush hour on a Friday morning. <laughs> Through uh, the tunnel. Still have memories of the bus. <laughs> <laughs> the bus that came so close to the junction. Anyway, anyway, anyway I was, yeah, I, I was reminded though, um, as you said that about a sketch I have for in tandem, mm. because it was around that time when we did it uh, that I learned that in tandem isn't anything to do with like two people. I guess I always thought it was like two people because I, I guess, guess that's, yeah. mm-hmm. Is it that's not? always what you see. No, it, and it's, it actually means one in front of another. So you could have. Uh, a carriage pulled by two horses side by side as a pair or you could have the horses in tandem and one in front of another or you could have six people on a bike in tandem, in tandem. one in front of another yeah yeah oh, okay nice okay. then something so, new every day a, an old one but but yeah good i can still vaguely, going. i'm trying to picture it or i think what i've got in my head is picturing your sketch on how to draw a horse i do i uh, I've got how to draw a bike, which actually I use all the time. I'm getting confused between bikes Some, and horses. Uh, there's a unicorn one, I think. Oh, maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe, maybe it's the horse. There's a, there's a really cool uh, artist called Ed Emberley, and he has just like super simple ways of drawing animals and everything, just with like circles and then semicircles and squares and triangles. And, and yeah, like, Oh, yeah, that's a, it. That's an it. early one. I think you're right. Maybe it was a horse. Um, or maybe a unicorn, work, which is it a works, horse. It works for a unicorn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can guess what the addition you have to add is. Um, <laughs> so moving away from um, bikes and tandems and horses, um, you know that, that question, how did you get here? Uh, that was asked, well, I... I witnessed this being asked to um, my girlfriend at the time once by my boss at the time. So he was having a birthday party. I went along and my boss and my girlfriend hadn't met each other. And that was his opening gambit to her when, when he met her was, um, oh, so how, how did you get here? Um, and she was a bit puzzled by it. I was like, well, what do you mean? Like, we took the tube to get here. Is that what you mean? What, why did you ask that? He goes, well, you know, how, how did you get here? Uh, open, open-ended question answer it however you like he was quite good like that he was quite a philosophical kind of guy he liked analysing people's behaviours and mindsets and, um, and that kind of stuff mm. yeah it yeah. depends it depends a bit how well you know people doesn't it as to how deep you're going to go there or how late it is in the night perhaps yeah or how much you care what people think of you <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah fair enough <laughs> quite fun quite fun and for- I once had an English teacher and, and he asked a similar question it was something like how did you get here and it's like what does that mean and and everybody's like well it means this and and he's like no because there's different ways it's you could say how did you get here or how did you get here or how did you get here or how did you get here how did you get here they all, they all yeah how did you get here yeah tom how did you get on that sandbank um mm-hmm. yeah there's yeah. a story so there. You, yeah. I suppose there are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that question works with a different emphasis on every single word, right? <laughs> you put the stress on the wrong syllable there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. My, my English teacher in America, when I was in elementary school, said that to me in earnest because I said, an, I said a, a British yes. pronunciation of a word. And he, he said, said that you put in the earnest. stress on the wrong syllable. <laughs> And I looked at him and I was like, is he being serious? I don't know. I can't, is that how they say syllable in America? <laughs> and, and then he laughed and it was all right. But I remember being petrified as a 10-year-old going, is this it? <laughs> that's amazing because that's, I get that from the Austin Powers film. Oh. I think uh, Mike Myers said oh, that at some point. Yeah. Yeah, well, he copied Mr. Schnell. There you go, Mr. Elementary Schnell. Elementary teacher at uh, Pleasant, Field, Pleasant Field Grammar School. Lovely. Lovely. Well, look, Whatever journey you've been on to have ended up listening to this podcast will possibly be a story of adventure in itself. A long stream of lifestyle decisions, turns in the road, and let's not forget your friend of mine, Google Algorithms. And now that you are here, let's do it. Let's podcast. And I have to say that the boys did really well there because we had to do all of that chat again because I forgot to record the first one. <laughs> and it was organic and it was natural and we took it in different directions. Natural, boys. Well done. Apologies for my mistakes. Professionals. 
This week we're tackling Jono's very fun sketch, actually, on the law of diminishing returns. Now you should be able to see that sketch in front of you now on your device, uh, but there's a link in the podcast description as well, just in case your podcast player has other ideas. Uh, you can find the whole of the back catalogue of Jono's sketches at sketchplanations.com. And if you'd like to send us a note about the podcast or anything we talk about within it, um, now or in fact any of the previous episodes, you can wing your emails over to hello at sketchplanations.com. You'd have thought a second time round, it'd have been on that a bit quicker. <laughs> well, I don't quite know um, when you're going to say it. I was quicker that time, but it's true. <laughs> Uh, we'll be going through your messages from last week at the end of the podcast. Thank you, Tommy. Professional as always. Um, mind you, this isn't a professional but po- doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yes. For the more of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jono, I already know the answer to this question, but I'm going to ask you it anyway because it brings me a lot of joy to think about it again. Um, but please, can you describe your sketch on the law of diminishing returns? And tell us where your idea for the sketch came from. Yeah, for sure. Even it makes me laugh every time. I yeah, I'm laughing. I'm, I remember. I'm generally laughing again, I remember and again. Where it's come from. So the law of dimini- diminishing returns is I, I know it from production processes, which is typically that at some point doing more of one thing stops giving you the same amount of benefit it did when you started adding more of it. And so I was trying to I was trying to give a more concrete example that people would get and so the sketch is just a chart of uh, broth quality and number of cooks is something hopefully everybody can relate to with um, the old phrase too many cooks spoil the broth and so on the one hand you've got this um, sole chef uh, cook I should say standing next to a giant vat of broth and the quality is low and then as you add cooks, the broth quality increases until uh, way over on the right hand side, you've got like uh, 12 cooks and you know, half of them are just having a tea break and the other half are getting in each other's way. And the broth quality has decreased again. Um, so the idea is that as you start adding cooks, it helps, but it gradually starts to help less and less until you can often get to a point where as you add more of something, it actually gets worse. And I well, think you, there are a lot of examples of that. I mean, in that example, you could say, <laughs> you could say, <laughs> you could say, too many cooks spoil the broth. I'm, I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> just put it out. Um, well, I should, I should I should say that I linked to it in the uh, text underneath, but it comes from the idea comes from a sketch series, BBC sketch for a long time. It was a bit of a love it or hate it kind of series. Yeah, uh, crazy. Uh, uh, comedy sketches the B- big train is the name of the series if you want to look yeah. it up there's a, there's a there's a few on youtube of, of mixed quality but some are hilarious and this one is this one is excellent yeah um which is somebody who's working in the broth department of uh of a factory and they're having a big seminar and somebody's up at the front and he's got a big whiteboard with the diagram a bit a bit like this with all these chefs crowded around some broth and he's explaining to everybody the vat of broth has too many broth makers or cooks, if you will, and it's this surfeit of cooks that's having such a negative impact on the broth. <laughs> There's too many cooking staff, and it's ruining the product. <laughs> You'd think, wouldn't you, that adding more cooks would make it better? But no, <laughs> <laughs> it's making it yeah. worse. <laughs> it's, it's making it worse. And so there's, it's actually Simon Pegg in one of his uh, really early roles. Um, I mean, it's full. There, it's yeah. full of comedy acting genius um and the, but the guy who it, the mate that like the um, the main protagonist of the sketch has pre- previously been at the the cake factory right and he's been moved to the broth division because of his his smart alec quips <laughs> and and in and in the cakes getting in the cake division there was uh it was a positive feedback sales report wasn't it on uh, how their their slightly warmed up cakes were selling really well <laughs> being bought at a tremendous rate selling like nobody's business <laughs> Go, selling like they're going out of fashion because we've warmed them up first well you could yeah. say <laughs> selling like hot cakes yeah, exactly yeah. I'll, right. I'll put i'll put a link in the podcast description to that sketch it's well worth a watch as are many other big train sketches absolutely it's probably funnier when simon Pegg does it yeah well you know yeah, but it's hard funny. to explain sketches isn't it but that's the yeah. that is the media through which we are communicating 
Um, and that's and that's the genesis of the sketch, really. Yeah, and it works really well, right? Because it makes the point because everyone knows the expression "too many cooks for the broth," right? Exactly. But so so it was in it was in production and production manufacturing that kind of thing that you first were thinking of, is it? Yeah, and and, and you know, and I like I see it in in my job and the design of products all the time. You know, like if you're doing uptime for software, for example, like if you don't want your site to go down, you can work on eliminating every last second of downtime and every last problem and every last bug but the, the effort to go those last few mm. cases is sometimes huge and there's a there's a really nice uh example classic example and I, I do have a sketch of this actually which is that if you do five user tests you typically find 85 percent of problems so if you if you make a new design do some tests you'll keep finding problems if you keep showing it to more people but actually, if you do five, you'll find 85% of the problems. So go yeah. fix those and then go do it again if you want to. Yeah. And so as yeah, as you add more, you get that law of diminishing returns kicking in. And I think you always have those decisions of like, how much is good enough? And is it worth us going that extra mile? Like if you're trying to machine something to a certain precision or tolerance, yeah. Yeah. if you want to go that extra little bit, it might cost you a fortune to go mm -hmm. to that extra little bit. And 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 is then it worth it? at yeah. that point, then it is the, um, you're looking at an economic uh, return and how much that diminishes. So how much in return will you be getting from having a product of that much higher quality that's cost that much to produce? Is that going to come back to you in sales or in revenue? Yeah, and I, I think I mean it's really tangible. I think I think about this a lot. With stereos, instead like a stereo in a car. So like obviously like listening to music on your phone is a bit unsatisfying, right? Mm -hmm. It's quite tinny. And so it's much better to have a better speaker and mm -hmm. it's much better to have a, a really good speaker. And at some point you're like, mm -hmm. this speaker costs twice as much as this other mega speaker mm -hmm. and I can't really hear the difference anymore. And it might be better, but yeah, for the for the cost and the effort that you're putting in, you can't hear the difference so well. So I, th I think it comes up in yeah how people appreciate and perceive products and the benefit you're putting in so some people that might be exactly what worth it most people probably not you know yeah tommy how do, how do you feel about the law of diminishing returns is it something you're conscious of as somebody who's in manufacturing and and making products and, and, and running a business yeah absolutely yeah Dif different facets of as it, right? you say as an inventor and someone who runs a small business i i you know, I find it's just one big battle against this sort of law of diminishing returns, you know, in my in my own personal behavior, in my engineers behavior, in my graphics team. You know, we are trying to bring products to market of the kind of the latest professional grade beauty innovations at the best possible prices. And you just constantly mm. have to be drawing that line on that that perfectionism. Um, uh, you know, we, we, tomorrow we launch 10 new products an event, at an event in central London and every single one of those was just a constant, you know, OK, do we do we, how much more time do we research on red lights or how many more red lights do we need to put on? How many how much larger should the battery be to kind of have this? Well, are people going to be bothered between the difference of being able to use this product 10 times or 15 times before having to recharge it. Mm. You know, you we could have made it that someone could use it and never have to recharge it again, but then it would be much bigger, much more expensive and that people expect to have to recharge things. And as John has just said, we, we had exa an example today of a label for a new bottle of gel polish remover, which had probably been looked at by 10 people. And one person replied saying, ooh, do you think in the instructions we should add, you know, buff the nail first? And I was like, oh, gosh, please, not another. But I was like, no, well, hang on. Actually, you're absolutely right. We do need to add those two words. Those are really important. So that was an example where an extra cook had helped improve the broth. Um, although the graphics lady who then had to change it was like, are you kidding me, Tom? I'm like, I agree. We've been through this a lot. But this change is worth making mm. because it's a really important little detail. Uh, and so I, yes. I did get her to, to make that change. <laughs> but that is, it, it's very <laughs> hard. It must be very hard with something yeah. that is undefined, like bringing a product to market and inventing and designing that product in the first place. Yes. It must be very hard to know when to stop. When is good enough? Because yeah. it's, you know, I think... 
uh, some people suffer from the kind of this desire for perfectionism yes. the whole time but you know at some point you know what is perfect you know it, try and embrace the ethos that you know not everything that you do has to be perfect you know it can be good enough and and maybe so i very vividly remember um a teacher telling me when i was 11 he was a sort of extra english teacher he was like tom you're a perfectionist and a dyslexic that they're, they're just you you can't be both and you will always be dyslexic so you're just going to have to try and work out your level of perfectionism and actually at age 11 that was a really important and really helpful lesson to learn um yeah i can imagine uh, and as you say you know i employ these brilliant engineers and they will carry on researching into something forever um but as a result i also have to employ some amazing sort of business people to help me kind of as you say draw that line of when do we when do we stop going into this and when do we make sure we've got the right brilliant level of product but something that we can actually launch because we could spend another five years researching this what what we're talking about here is this is this a little bit eighty twenty rule, you know that eighty percent of the the success or the positive output from our actions and energies results from twenty percent of the input. Yeah, twenty like percent of the time or energy that you put in. Yeah, is what's going to yield eighty percent of the of the result. Definitely, but it's a very good hindsight rule. I find you don't often sure. if you knew what the 80 20 was when you were doing it you wouldn't do the yeah. 20. if you if you knew where that threshold was but you yeah. often don't know it until after the fact um which is which is pretty tricky i must say i think lord sugar is a bit of a he's very good in this respect he is very good at identifying the areas that are really important to look at and where you can simplify things. Um, and there was a lovely example that's in his book when he first launched the Sky boxes. So I don't know if you know, like the reason Sky was able to launch is basically Amstrad made those first few boxes and the dishes that went on side yeah. of the houses. And there's a lovely story in his book where um, he's quite rude about uh, techie people. So he was like, these boffins had told me that the shape of this metal had to be this and that and blah, blah, blah. And it was going to cost 80 pounds for this perfect shape. And I was like, it's just a dish, right? So I found this bin lid maker in Birmingham who charged me <laughs> literally a pound for something that these boffins were telling me was, you know, that is high science, but it was going to cost 80 quid. And we put it on and lo and behold, it worked perfectly. Amazing. <laughs> wow. boffins. And, and so he was like, well, so therefore they were, Amstrad were able to bring out, you know, those wow. boxes at like, 69 quid i think they launched at instead of like hundreds of quid you know the yeah. the, the satellite dish alone was going to cost 80 to make but it, yeah but they move. used a bin lid manufacturer instead and it worked brilliantly well, this is, and so the, again yeah so the, i think your point about um in hindsight is <laughs> obviously very very useful but you know if you if you look at your graph john on the sketch it's all about trying to, I guess, predict and analyze as best you can when you're at that point of optimization, right? When you're, whatever it is you're increasing, whatever it is you are um, uh, adding to the process or to the system, where that stops, that that's that's the key, isn't it? That and I guess that comes from experience and um, and expertise. I think it's not just where it might start getting worse and there are definitely cases where you know you like you, you keep adding people to a team yes and it and it does speed you up up to a point and then after that it probably just gets in the way and yep and, communication and, becomes yeah, difficult and, and you have to you have to manage it and 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 it, and, and it actually might get worse but there are but it's also i think you're you're constantly having to try and make a trade-off like yeah like we can make it better but it will be a bit better like i can fix another bug yeah but instead of fixing that bug we could live with a the odd problem and mm. we'll build something else which will have have more benefit and you always have to make those trade-offs because you're not getting like like fixing a bug that stops somebody like your your website turning on you know just crashes everything of course that's worth doing so you get loads of value for fixing that yeah. but fixing something which affects you know, 2% of people who use this browser once a week, 
you're like, well, okay, well, maybe we should do that. Maybe we shouldn't. And and that's the way, like, you're still getting some benefit by doing it. But so, so I, uh, yeah, there's a point where it gets worse very often. But there's also points where you're like, well, should we? I don't know, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I think that's just, it's always difficult to yeah. try and make those trades because there's no, yeah, it's, it's like it's all a bit of a gray area, you know? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, we've talked a lot about work so far kind of work applications to this but there there are loads of different yeah. applications where i think it applies um in your professional life in maybe your family life in your home life in yeah. your kind of social life um i mean I'm, I'm thinking back to when we were all revising for exams at university and i stayed up i did some all night revision sessions because i just, you know left it all too late and obviously didn't know enough at the time so you're cramming and you're cramming and you're cramming which meant that you got into that exam and you're absolutely knackered surely it would have been better to have said right enough's enough i'm going to get at least four hours sleep and go in a little bit fresh <laughs> at least four hours Crazy. <laughs> that's how robbie rolled <laughs> yeah. and it's and it's i think it's the same with sport as well if you're training for a race or something you know if you're cramming in your training in the last two weeks Actually, you're probably better off giving your body a really good rest so that you're going into the into the race fresh. I've I've definitely struggled with that before as well. Yeah, I, I can relate to to both of those. Like the the studying for exams, like you can do every single pass paper ever, and it might add one or two marks. Yeah, but it might take you another two days of studying. So, like, is that worth it? Mm. Um, and I think I think with with health as well, like yeah, doing it doing a little bit of exercise is a lot better than doing no exercise and doing yes. moderate exercise on a regular basis is really good. And, but doing tons of exercise every day, knack your you joints, know, you know, maybe it's good, but certainly not nearly as good as like getting off the sofa um, in the first place, you yeah. know, in terms of your benefit, unless you're training for ultras or something, you don't need to do that much. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's things like friendships, right? So mm. the, how many, Friends, it's, I mean, we talked a little bit about this mm-hmm. in the episode on Dunbar's law at the beginning of the series. But, you know, the more and more and more friends you have, how well do you get, how well do you really know any of them? Or I, I think about like how, how often you see people as well. Yeah. So, like, it's obviously not brilliant to see people once every two years. So, once a year is better. Once every six months, probably better. Once every three months. But when you get down to like, I don't know. Should I see somebody every day? You're probably getting yeah. <laughs> Are you yeah. getting dim- diminishing returns? Like maybe that, you could actually be better off if you yeah. saw each other a bit less. And <laughs> gosh, it's tricky, isn't it? It's tricky all yeah. this stuff. What's the optimum amount to, yeah. to see people? I don't know. Boozing as a <laughs> law of diminishing returns. I mean, first first couple of pints. Yeah. Oh, lovely! I'm really <laughs> on the up here. I'm having a great time. Four. I mean, who am I talking about here? <laughs> not, not me anymore. Not me anymore. That's for sure. For alcohol-free when you, beverages, maybe Robert. Uh, yeah. Right. But then, when you've really started hitting the, the gone from the beer to the wine and the spirits, I mean, then it's all downhill from there, isn't it? Uh, the, yeah. The, just the, sliding the, down that chart. And the tandem that you were talking about earlier, you know, how I was sitting on the back, uh, potentially watching videos. Um, I think we all found that there was a certain (laughs) maximum speed that you could go to that really wasn't any point putting, trying to put any more effort in because the massiveness of it, it didn't go any faster. That's how you justified it, Tony. You you, you yeah. use science yeah. to try and bamboozle like, wow, everybody on the bike. No everybody point. else is working really hard because Tom's not pedalling. <laughs> so, but I was I was looking into this a little bit, and historically, yes. apparently, one of the earliest mentions of the law of diminishing returns um, was recorded in the mid 1700s. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, an economist called Jacques Turgot or Turgot, um, and he was articulating what would become the law of diminishing returns in agriculture. And again, most of the early references that I've found were all about agriculture. Mm, Um, So, you know, with the same amount of land, um, you're employing more and more people to come and work on it. And at a point... Doesn't make any difference. Those um, those returns drop. Yeah. I've heard the same about, like, fertilisation, like, adding fertiliser. Like, obviously, obviously adding a bit really helps and adding a good amount really, really helps. But then beyond some point, it starts to, like actually just wash off mm, and yeah. doesn't go get taken up by the plants at all you know that kind of thing so i think you get that with fertilization as well yeah what about holidays so how many holidays do you have a year roughly mm. two two main holidays 
It depends what you call a holiday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but what if every day was a holiday? Oh. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. Re- you wouldn't get the benefit anymore, would you? Yeah. I, it's it's true. Be a different different thing. It's. Um, I'm sure there's same with like food and treats. You know, a nice little bit of chocolate every now and then. Uh, Ooh, that's nice. Really. Mm. What if you started having cheesecake? Of, I really like cheesecake, but if you had it every yeah, day, I was having it every day. You'd lose the taste <laughs> of it pretty soon. Um, Jono, yeah. I recently came up with one in the shower that I thought you might quite like um, because it's environmental as well. <laughs> in the fact that I've started when I have the shower, rather than because I used to always get in the shower and put it on full power, and you'd sit there in full power. And I was like, actually, you know, with gas prices, global warming, so I started just having my shower to about half, and. I was finding it wasn't, there was a lot oh, less yeah. water coming out, but actually quite a lot of the water doesn't really hit you or you don't really notice. And I found I could get all the way down to at least half the power and sometimes a bit less and almost not really notice the difference. I was like, I'm that's really right, nice. Tommy, this, this makes perfect sense, right? If you go full power in a shower, yeah. right, I'm, I, I deem myself a bit of a shower expert. <laughs> you are. You are. <laughs> Um, if you go full power in a shower, most of it just bounces off you, yeah. right? And it just it ba- hits you at such a force that it bounces off and sprays the walls. And so it's the walls who are getting most of the yeah. heat and the energy and the and the soothing of oh. the hot water. So come in halfway, <laughs> and then it, it not not a dribble, you know, yeah, a nice. Yeah. You can feel there's some force behind it, yeah. but it's not going to spray off everywhere, and it's actually going to stick to you and run down. Yeah, that's mm. nice. That's for you. And maybe a little bit of power at the beginning, a little bit at the end, just to you know, but. Treat treat yourself with the full power at some points, but yeah, yeah. Well, shower manufacturers doing <laughs> missing out on all these what? Yeah, yeah, potential exactly. improvement. But, but the natural instinct is you get in a shower and you just flick it to what you think is on the sort of binary off or on. But actually, there's that whole spectrum in between. Yeah, I, I don't no, think I, I don't see in like no. that. I I see the spectrum mm. and I like to enjoy variety <laughs> within the spectrum. But I'm a geek. <laughs> Our shower, actually, to be fair to the shower makers, has uh, you turn it on and it stops. It has a stopping point on yep. the, on the control. The eco at, ab- at about sixty five, seventy percent or something. Yeah, and then you have to push it a little bit more with to get it the full power. And actually, as you say, like mm-hmm. I very rarely need to do that. I think that with taps as well. Like, taps, you know, you, you put the um the low flow. Yes. Uh, things so it's sort of coming Bow through a, a, a filled a grid almost and so you get half the amount of water through and it's absolutely fine in fact it's more efficient it is um, and, you, and you don't notice the difference yeah no, I'm with it. No, I'm with it on that note I'm going to turn yeah, the brightness of my screen down a bit as well because <laughs> does it make that much yeah. difference being that getting does it? returns yeah it's almost dazzling turn it's it being blind turn it down a bit <laughs> Tom's going to go around the house just turning turning everything down dimmers just turn it law of diminishing returns sir I'm turning turning the lights lights. I did did think about that actually I was trying to think about when diminishing returns might be a problem and I was thinking about tidying and when you might have differences (laughs) in perception as to how tidy is tidy enough so you might stop and go well I could tidy that last bit but this is fine and somebody mm-hmm. else might go this is still not fine and if we tidy that it yes. would be much better <laughs> and you think yes. it would just be a little bit better and uh yeah that might yeah. lead to arguments Tom this is did i this bank. is interesting did i ever yes. so it's a, yeah i've got uh, sorry it's a difference in interpretation of of where that peak point is yes and so when sarah and i 10 years ago decided to move in together my first rule is that we must get a cleaner because I knew that my level of it's clean enough would be very different to her level of what clean is. And so therefore I'd always end up getting in trouble, you know, for the shower, for example, I think I would probably, well, I'm, I, was, I wasn't going to ask which way that went. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you were going to leave that ambiguous. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> but it's good to learn each other's levels on these things. I've found. Can I give you guys another little fact, Ted? Hmm. So apparently Henry Ford of Ford Motor Vehicles uh, ran a lot of productivity experiments to determine how to get the highest value out of his production lines and his employees. And um, in an interview in 1926, Henry Ford concluded that 40 hours a week was the optimum number of hours for his employees on the production lines. Mm. 
um finding that you know when people work more than 40 hours their their work put their output sorry per employee their work put how much work have you done today yeah Yeah. Uh, yeah, loads um their output starts to decline yeah um you know because because and i think i think this is an important fact within the law of diminishing returns especially when you're looking at things like production and manufacturing if you're not making alterations to the factory right so you're not bringing in more machines you're bringing in more employees but everything else stays the same then there is that that point of diminishing return if you kept scaling everything up proportionally on your optimum kind of linear growth line would it still work I think I think you still I think you still get it at at some point. But I, I was I, I was reminded when you were when you were talking about that sort of study, there was around um there's this chap called Taylor and to Taylorism was like the optimization of production lines down to like timing everybody's yeah, individual yeah. steps. How long does it take you to move this part from here to here? And then he would go around and treat people like cogs in a machine, literally. Yeah. And but yeah, I yeah, see yeah. some studies about temperature and productivity in offices. And it, interestingly, I remember it it said basically like the lower the temperature in the office, the more the productivity goes up. And and I just remember that in the study they didn't find they didn't find it leveling enough. It just it kept lowering <laughs> the temperature in the office, and it kept it kept on going up. Obviously, they didn't you know start testing at zero degrees or anything like that. But yeah, you, you would imagine it was probably going to level off at some point. At right? some point, it definitely yeah. levels off. At some point, definitely. Do you think it helps us live a happier life if we're conscious of? the law of diminishing returns in stuff that we do and try and figure ways to to game it definitely to kind of know the optimum definitely i think well, life is I- a big experiment to try and find the kind of optimums of certain different things um the optimums of when to speak and when not to for example being being happy with what you've got is a good is a good recipe there, there yeah. are some studies on how money affects happiness and i think that's like a real case of diminishing returns Ooh. oh yeah yeah that's a good one yeah that's so a good that's one. really good so you can imagine if you've if your income is really low let's say an extra ten thousand dollars a year makes a huge difference in getting your you know basic necessities yes. of life covered right you know yep. having a having a house a place to live and being able to buy the food and stuff as you go up, you can imagine that like, going from, you know, let's say 30K to 30 to 50K probably also makes a difference. But then it starts to sort of slow down this effect. And it's not to say that, uh, this is to my understanding, definitely like wealthier people, people are happier. But if you add an extra £10,000 mm. to a low level of income, it makes a big difference in your yep. happiness. If you add an extra ten thousand, you're already earning one hundred and twenty. Yep. Then it doesn't make much of a difference, and so it's sort of it, you get diminishing returns there as well. I think as it levels off, but you know, yeah. So, so like people might think, oh well, I need to win the lottery, and I need to have this, you know, not just this house, but a bigger house, a much bigger house. And will it actually make you happier? Probably not, mm. or not very much happier. So where where do you think it doesn't? hold true where do you do you think there are any aspects of life or areas where this law doesn't kick in with diminishing returns that's a good i was thinking question. along along the lines like like perfecting a, a skill if you want to be a really highly skilled musician or woodworker or something olympic athlete is there enough time in one's life to have truly perfected it it sort of feels like Olympic athlete. It's an Olympic athlete. Yeah. To be the very, very best at something. You have to go all in. Absolutely everything. Minutiae uh, details in your training regime and, and everything that you prepare with. I was thinking it's possible to it's possible to make a a business where the like the 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 raison d'etre or the the mission of your business is you're selling a story about being the very best yeah and and you can charge disproportionately large amounts for that yeah. and to some degree to some degree i think like apple do that kind of stuff right like 
you can buy a laptop for six hundred pounds, uh, but if you want to buy an Apple one, they're going to charge you two and a half thousand or something. Yeah, and it's better. How much better? Well, you have that perception that it's really oh, AirPods. I struggle with I struggle with AirPods. You know, they're a little bit they're a bit better <laughs> probably than a lot of other wireless earbuds yeah but they can charge twice as much for them and i think you you perhaps you mark it on the basis that we are that much better and you and you need this and it yeah. makes you want it so maybe there's something there as well yeah like luxury what about goods perhaps luxury goods like what wine about... and whiskey and and those sort of things you feel are very much in that similar field johnny that there is no there is no top limit everything just keeps getting pushed 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 potentially and that's sort of what you're selling and that's your M- mo yeah that's yeah. the old veblen goods thing yeah there, isn't it yeah it is <laughs> yeah what about yeah. um what about scientific discovery it does get harder and harder to dis- discover new things i guess yes. or or exploration of space should, yeah, we just, just, should we just stop? Because we've got, oh, we've got enough now. We've probably, we've probably identified enough species on Earth. Shouldn't bother anymore. I do often wonder about parenting, and oh, and on. that. And yes, there is diminishing returns in terms of how much time and how much quality of time. But someone did very wisely say to me once, you know, kids actually just want you around as much as possible. Like they just really love being mm-hmm. close to you, being with you at, at the earlier ages, certainly. Um, and so I do try and do that as much as I possibly can. There must be a diminishing returns, but I think kids would happily have you around more and more and more, certainly at the younger ages. Yeah, well, I was going to say, wait till they turn to teenagers. Yeah, That's they're possibly not interested. where you see the yeah. diminishing return. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah well, th- thinking about where it doesn't apply... And I'm not I'm not quite sure about this, but there's one of my favourite sketches, which is is about, and I think this is I do think you may see this you, in your example with the label text, Tom. Like I always think, people say the devil is in the detail, but I think like the diamonds are in the details. Like actually, Ooh, it's sometimes nice. the details really matter. And there's a mm. sketch which I really like, which is this poem for want of a nail. And I don't know if you know it, but I'll read it out because it's just so obvious when once you hear it and so the poem the poem goes for want of a nail the shoe was lost for want of a shoe the horse was lost for want of a horse the rider was lost for want of a rider the battle was lost for want of a battle the kingdom was lost uh, and all for want of a nail oh and that starts to mess with your head doesn't it when you're when you're doing diminishing returns yeah. and then somebody comes up with something <laughs> right at the end and you know like, that could be the nail that fixes yeah. the shoe which helps the horse which keeps the rider which wins the battle which keeps the kingdom yeah yeah wow. yeah so yeah. so on that example for the last uh six weeks i've been experimenting with different magnet strengths um because the magnet has not been holding on this zoom mirror correctly on a product and we've literally spent six weeks researching into magnet strengths and configuration of because we know that if you put something on you want it to stay you don't want it slipping but oh my oh my gosh but we we know we've got to get it right it's hugely diminishing returns but it has to be perfect in this example Or, or is it? Is it? Is it like a, is it like <laughs> a step? It? It's a step. No, 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 no. I was going to say like it's like it's not it's not good enough, and then it's good enough. Yeah. And you don't have like a gradual thing in that case. Um, anyway, yeah. It's 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 it, as I'm wondering about like yeah, should I do that final edit or something? I also have in the back yes. of my mind for want of a nail. And oh, it's very no. hard to know. It, it's oh. impossible to know without hindsight which is the yeah. right thing to do. Do you go eighty twenty? law of diminishing or do you go no it's actually worth it this time it it all comes down to your you know what you feel isn't it what your where your passion is and 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 where your energies are for for anything at any time maybe yeah for that matter you got the straw that broke the camel's back yeah and you got tipping points so Mm. you know you if you get just that one more follower or one more person to buy yeah. it, maybe we'll tip it over something to start it. rolling by itself. Ugh, chicken and egg things, you know, Ugh, difficult. Ugh. Good luck, everyone. <laughs>
Tommy, did you have something you wanted I, to say? To this, yeah. Um, to, that might round us off. Um, so I think there's also a big example in our podcast recording. We tend to sit here talking for between 35 and an hour and 35 sometimes. And then Rob, you amazingly edit it down to a, a 30 minute. Uh, and they always sound fantastic. And I slightly always wonder, what did he cut out? and What did he miss? But I think we could carry on talking for another three days and probably come up with some more examples, but it wouldn't you wouldn't let it be longer than half an hour because our listeners probably don't want to listen to half an hour. They've had enough and just the perfect amount. What a great way to round us off, Tommy. Thank you very much. Um, anything else? Where, any o AOB, any other business on the law of diminishing returns? Oh, I, I do have one. So I always get invited to the live filming of the final episode of The Apprentice. And they sort of twig me nice. before saying, you know, and at the end, we might come to you and ask for it, ask you a quick question. So I'm there sort of for four hours watching this, thinking that they might ask me a little question at the end, which given I'm not on telly that much anymore, kind of is quite a big deal. And possibly I'm trying to get illegally a plug about my brand onto uh, onto the BBC and I and I sit there but I know that if I talk for more than about 10 seconds they'll just cut it because they don't have more than that much time for me and a thing mm. but also yeah. you want to say a lot and, and, and sometimes if I you know whenever I speak too long it gets cut if I create a nice little quick short segment it might get through but there's that's a lovely example Thank you very much, boys. The law of diminishing returns. And as with so many topics that we chat about on this podcast, it's one of those things in life that's just everywhere, right? You know, it's, it's all around us all the time. Um, sometimes we're probably conscious of it and other times less so. Uh, but it's definitely a thing. Of course it is. John has done a sketch on it. It must be. <laughs> it must be. <laughs> Uh, if you have some examples in your lives where you've discovered that the law of diminishing returns has crept in, then let us know. Email us on hello at email us on hello at sketchplanations.com. And we'll be back with this week's post bag very shortly. But for now, Tommy, I am going to close out before the law comes after us with its truncheon and its handcuffs in hand. It weren't us, Gov. You'll never catch us. We're not going down. Go well, stay well. Goodbye. Goodbye. Good night. See ya. All music on this podcast series is sourced from the very talented Frank Cinelli. And you can find loads more tracks at frankcinelli.com.